This morning we continue with our sermon series through the Psalter. Our text for today is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Again, that's Psalm chapter 103, verses 1 through 5. Would you go ahead and join me in standing for the reading of God's Word? I'll read our text for us in its entirety. When I finish reading the text, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, at which point I would appreciate very much if you would respond by saying, thanks be to God. One final time, our text for today is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is the word of the Lord. All right, please be seated. Let's begin with verses 1 and 2. Uh, The primary point in these first two verses that I want to draw out of the text is this, the art of preaching to yourself. And we might even go beyond that, not just the art or the craft of preaching to ourselves, being skilled in this art, but the necessity, the importance, the significance of preaching to ourselves. And we know that we have been commanded as Christians, to preach the good news of the gospel to all nations. We are commanded to disciple the nations and to baptize them into the name of the triune God and to teach them to obey all of Christ's commands. Not just some of them, but all of Christ's commands. Even those commands which have civil application. Commands that have Uh, practical implication and application for the church, for the home, for the state, for the marketplace, all these things. We are called to preach the gospel, to baptize people into the name of the triune God, and to disciple people by teaching them to be in obedience to the lordship of Jesus Christ in everything, in every realm of life. But did you know, Christian, that we are also expected required, commanded to preach the gospel to ourselves. That you and I need to be daily reminded of the truth of the gospel. That it's not just that we're called to preach the gospel to the world, to the unbeliever, to the unregenerate, to those who do not have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but you and I need to preach the gospel to ourselves. And we need to do so frequently. Psalm 103 verses 1 through 2 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice that in this psalm, David is not praying to the Lord. The question that we might ask is this, Who is it that the psalmist is addressing? Because often in the Psalms, the Psalms serve as the songbook of Israel. And so what we see in the Psalter are songs and prayers, which means often whether it be worship, song, or a prayer, the audience that is being addressed is the Lord, that the psalmist is speaking to God. But in this context, in Psalm 103, the audience is not the Lord. The audience is, he he doesn't say, bless the Lord, O the Lord. No, bless the Lord, O my soul. The psalmist is speaking to himself. He's speaking, we we might add to that, he's speaking to the deepest part of himself. He's speaking to his inner being, his inner man. And we must assume that he is speaking to himself in such a manner because there is a need to do so. We must assume that that the psalmist is saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, because in that moment, the psalmist probably doesn't feel like blessing the Lord. It seems as though he has some other inclination in this moment. It, It could be that he's angry with God, bitter towards God, We certainly have psalms like that, especially from David, where he's frustrated towards God. We have texts like that in the book of Job, 
where Job feels as though something is happening that is not right. Even then, he never accuses God. Job is sinless. He's righteous is what the text says. He's blameless. But he's still, he says, oh, if I might, if there were some way to have an audience with God. And this is where in the book of Job, we even see the gospel, where Job says, if there was only a mediator, I know that I could never gain an audience with God and be able to stand, but if only there was someone who could go between me and God, someone who, who could allow for me to get a hearing with God, to, to have standing before him, who would mediate between God and me. All the way in the book of Job, we see the need for Christ, the need for a mediator. There is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. But the point is this, there are texts, whether it be the book of Job or whether it be the Psalter, where, where the author is frustrated towards God. There's a sense of anger. There's a sense of bitterness. But there are also times where, where maybe the psalmist isn't angry towards the Lord or frustrated to the Lord, but, but he's simply anxious. He's worried. He's overwhelmed with fret and anxiety, wrought by worry. And it seems as though that may be the case in our text today. And I don't know about you, but when I struggle with anxiety, which for the record is a sin, and that doesn't mean that we can't be compassionate towards one another, because that's the beauty of Christ. He is a merciful, Hebrew says, a merciful high priest. Because he himself was tempted as we are. And, and I know that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's like, well, yeah, he was tempted, but not really, because he's the son of God. No, the son of God was tempted more, not less, more than you and I. You know why? <laughs> the best illustration I could give is this. Um, it's, it's almost like, a, like some kind of wrestling match where, where there's the opportunity for you to tap out. That you're in some, you, you've found yourself by your opponent in some sort of submission hold, right? They're, they're, they're breaking your arm. They're, they're squeezing your neck and cutting off your airway, your circulation, your, your ability to breathe. And, and what you and I do is we tap and the pressure stops. Have you ever resisted sin, resisted temptation to the point where it hurts? Have, have you noticed that? See, some, some of us, sadly, and this is an indictment to you and to I, but, but for many of us, we don't know what it's like to, to struggle underneath temptation to the point of sweating drops of blood, to struggle under the weight of temptation, resisting temptation to where, to where it's, it's like, like an anvil that's been placed on our back, weighing us down. Jesus was not tempted less. He was tempted more because he resisted more. And as we continue to resist temptation, we only experience more of it, not less. And Hebrews says that because he took the likeness of men, because he himself has been tempted, he's a merciful high priest. He, he sympathizes. He is compassionate towards us in our sin. Now, the Bible says this, be anxious for nothing. And so I, I, I don't want to beat around the bush. I don't, I don't want to lighten that blow. I know that it's very popular in our culture today to, to say that, well, to, to basically to, to find a way to alleviate any moral culpability for the person who is wrestling with anxiety. But biblically speaking, be anxious for nothing is a command. Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Meaning that for the Christian to be anxious for anything, because the Bible commands us to be anxious for nothing, to be anxious for anything is a breach of God's command. It is, therefore, sin. And yet, in the very same breath, we can say that although this is a sin, our merciful Savior has compassion towards sinners. So, so we can say both and uphold perfect biblical fidelity. We can say without making excuses for anxiety, we can say anxiety is a sin, and yet we, following the likeness of Christ, have compassion 
for the one who is burdened and plagued by anxiety. Both of these things are simultaneously true. So we don't have to exercise compassion towards those who wrestle with anxiety by, by, by assuaging their consciences and ours by somehow doing theological gymnastics to make it, to make it as though anxiety had no moral implications. No, it, it is a sin to be anxious. And we have a merciful Savior who is compassionate towards the sinner. Both of these things are simultaneously true. And I think that in our text today, the author, in this case, David, is probably anxious. He is probably weighed down with worry and fear. And I don't know about you, but in those moments of anxiety, when I sin in that way, when I am anxious, even though God's word commands me to be anxious for nothing, in those times, what I tend to do is focus on all the things that I'm worried about. If anything, it's, it's as though I begin to list all of the different problems in my life. It's like I'm, I'm calculating and, and making a list of all the various challenges, all the, all the fears, all these outward and in, internal threats that are causing me such distress. That's what gets the focus of my thoughts. That's what gets the focus of my energy, my attention. And the psalmist in our text today, he does precisely the opposite. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not what I'm anxious about, forget not what worries me, forget not this situation externally and, and this problem within, no, forget not all his benefits. So the psalmist, when he's anxious about worldly affairs, he chooses to focus his thoughts and attention and energy upon the benefits of the promises of God. You and I, are prone to forget the kindness and the mercy and the benefit of the Lord. And especially in moments of fear. Especially in moments of anxiety. That in these moments, you and I are perhaps the most prone to, towards giving so little, if, if any thought at all, to the gospel to the covenant that God has established with us through faith in his son Jesus Christ and with all the corresponding promises and blessings and benefits of that covenant. And yet that is precisely what we need. We think that we're helping ourselves. This is the deception. This is the ploy. We think that we are somehow helping ourselves in moments of anxiety to stop and dwell upon fear, upon all the things that are causing us to fret. And yet, it does no good at all. Charles Spurgeon once said that, that anxiety does not rid tomorrow of its troubles, but that it merely rids today of its peace. That's all it does. This is why the scripture says to be anxious for nothing. This is why Jesus himself says in the Sermon on the Mount not to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You and I, I, I promise you, our problem is not that, that, we're, that we're just not giving enough thought and attention to the things that worry us. It, it, you know, if I just carved out a little bit more time in my weekly schedule to sit and think about all the things that make me afraid, I'd be better off. No, no, I don't think so. That's not your problem. Your problem is not that you're giving too little attention to your anxieties. Your problem and mine is that we give far too little thought, far too little attention to the benefits of God's mercy and grace. And so, again, the audience in our text today that we see in the very first two verses, the psalmist is saying this. He's not saying, to you, O Lord, I do such and such. The audience is not God himself. It's not a prayer. The audience is his own soul. He's saying, soul, get it together. 
Soul, stop trembling. Stop being so anxious. Stop obsessing over the challenges of today and certainly the challenges of tomorrow. Soul, hope in God. And don't just hope in God. Don't just trust in God as an alternative to your anxiety, but bless God. Praise the Lord. Bless His holy name. And as you, soul, seek to bless the Lord, worship the Lord, praise the Lord, begin to think and, and begin to call to remembrance all of his benefits. There's something, this is worship. He, he's commanding himself. He is, he's, he is, it's like a call to worship, like we do each Lord's Day in our liturgy, except it's a self-call. He is calling himself to worship the Lord. But notice, that there's an ingenious strategy and there's something profound that we can learn about worship in the end of verse 2 of our text. Bless the Lord. He's calling his soul to worship the Lord, to bless the Lord. But he also says, and forget not all his benefits. That in a very real sense, a large element of our worship, whether it be private worship throughout the week or Lord's Day worship as we gather together, a large element of the Christian's worship is remembrance. It is to remember the Lord, who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised. Forget not all his benefits. John Gill, in commentating on these first two verses, says this, even good men are very apt to forget the gospel and its benefits as the Israelites of old who sung the praises of the Lord and soon forgot his works. The Lord, knowing the weakness of his people's memories, appointed an ordinance to be continued to the end of the world to commemorate a principal blessing and benefit of his redemption by his son and has also promised his spirit to bring all things to their remembrance. And this they should be concerned for, that they do remember what God has done for them in order both to show gratitude and thankfulness to him and for the encouragement of their faith and hope in him. It is such a mercy of God that he has appointed to us, his people, his children, an ordinance to be continued to the end of the world that is given for many reasons, but one of the chief reasons being remembrance. That in the Lord's Supper, in the bread and the wine, we are called and commanded to reflect and to remember the body of Christ, which is given to you. And the blood of Christ that is shed for the remission of sins and the cup of the new covenant, and all of the promises and benefits of this new covenant that the Lord has given to His church. He has given to His church the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to be rightly administered each Lord's Day. I do believe it should be administered weekly. Why? Because there's an explicit command in the Scripture to do so weekly? No. But because we, as human beings, both fallen and finite, are so prone to forget. So prone to forget his blessings, so prone to forget his kindness, his promises, his benefits. I don't know about you, but I need weekly to be reminded of the new covenant, which I have been grafted into through union with Christ by virtue of faith that all the things that God has promised, that they rightly belong to me. And that each week, by faith, we ingest the promises of God, the benefits of Christ. And this is a covenantal ceremony that it's not merely that, that the Lord's Supper is, is an ordinance that, that brings to remembrance for us the promises of God. 
But in our partaking of the Lord's Supper in faith, there's this very real sense in which the Lord himself is reminded of the covenant that he's established with us. Think of Genesis chapter 9, the Noahic covenant. That God, he sets his bow in the sky to remind himself of the promise that he made with Noah to never again flood the earth. That he put up his bow, he, he hung up his weapon, his bow as it were. Which is beautiful imagery because Revelation says that a day is coming where he will take his bow back down and bring judgment upon the world. But for now, God has hung up His bow. And for those who are in Christ, there is no longer enmity between us and God. No hostility remains. We have been brought near. And we have been made by grace willing. In our inner being, we delight now in the law of God. God has hung up His bow, meaning that God is no longer at war with us. God has made peace with us. And he has set up his bow as a reminder not only to us but to himself. So too in our partaking of the Lord's Supper, it is a covenantal ceremony where, where we're reminded that we've been made one with Christ Jesus, that he's the vine, that we're the branches, and that through him, he's the conduit. Through him, we... we We rightly receive all the benefits and all the blessings of God. All of his tender mercies. All the sure mercies of David are ours through Christ. And we remember this. And he remembers this. And that we're not just made one with Christ, but one with each other. That in the gospel, we not only gain adoption as the sons of God to where God becomes our father, but we also gain, in a horizontal sense, brothers and sisters, a family of God, siblings in Christ. And all these things we are reminded of as fallen and finite creatures as we partake of the Lord's Supper weekly. And God himself likewise is reminded of the covenant that he has established with his people through His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 3 of our text. It says this, Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Here in verse 3, the psalmist begins to list the benefits of the Lord. Remember at the end of verse 2, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. What are they? Here he begins to list some of the benefits of the Lord, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. It is no mere coincidence that the psalmist, as he lists the benefits of the Lord, begins with the blessing of pardon, for without which all outward blessings only serve to further condemn the sinner. The assurance of pardon is rightly ascribed to God, for none can forgive sins but he. As our sins are multiplied, the Savior multiplies pardons. For where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Romans 5.20 In the case of those who have been united with Christ through faith, Christ leaves no sin unforgiven. That is, for the Christian who is in Christ, all our sin has been forgiven. Original sin, actual sin, sin in desire, sin in thought, sin in speech, sin in deed, sins of omission, the things that we should do that we don't, and sins of commission, the things that we are forbidden from doing, and yet we do all the same. All of our sin, past, present, and future, has been laid upon Christ. This is the first of the benefits of the new covenant. This is the first benefit, the first promise, the first blessing that the Christian must recount, that we must remember, that we must bring to mind. Because apart from this blessing, all the other external blessings of God, they only serve to further condemn us. What good are the blessings of God in this life if our sin has not been forgiven. 
The blessings of God that are temporary, here and now, in this life, those blessings only become further evidence, further support, further vindication for our judgment if we have not been born again by grace through faith in Christ and had all our sins washed away by His blood. And so the psalmist, by no mere coincidence, he first lists that God is the one who forgives all your iniquity. But notice, he doesn't just say that God forgives. He says that God forgives all our iniquity and heals all our diseases. Now, certainly, this portion of verse 3 has been taken out of context on numerous occasions. What is meant by this? What does it mean that God promises for his people to heal all your diseases? Because think about this for a moment. We have to be careful in exegeting verse 3 of our text because whatever hermeneutical gymnastics you might use for the second half of verse 3, it would be inconsistent and even hypocritical to not use the same hermeneutic practice on the beginning of verse 3. And if we're not careful and say, well, God just heals some diseases, (laughs) well, I hope that he doesn't just forgive some iniquity. I mean, we're all in agreement as Christians who believe in the gospel of free grace that the only way any of us can have right standing before God is to have all our sins atoned for. Not some, not most, not many, but all of our sins washed away. And the righteousness of Christ wrapped around us as a garment, as a robe through faith. There is no hope for humanity apart from the forgiveness of all sin. It cannot be some, and it cannot be most. It must be all. But the text, in the very same breath, says he forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. All. John Gill, again, I believe is very helpful on this point. He says this, Though the Lord is the physician of the bodies as well as the souls of men, and sometimes heals the diseases of soul and body at once, as in the case of the paralytic man in the gospel. Pausing briefly, remember that? When the man was brought in who was lame by his friends, and Jesus says, take heart, your sins are forgiven. And the religious rulers of his day who are witnessing this event, they begin to grumble under their breath. They're saying, who who is this who claims to have the authority to forgive sin? And Jesus says, well, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Now, in an objective sense, it's easier to say, rise up and physically walk than to say, you, a sinful wretch who have raised your fist in defiance against God could be forgiven of all your iniquity. In objective terms, making this man walk is easier than forgiving his sin. Far easier. But what Jesus means by this rhetorical question, which is easier, is what he's saying is this. Which is easier to prove? Because if I say rise up and walk, there's a way that we can visibly and externally immediately test whether or not I in fact had the authority to make this man walk. He's either going to get up and walk or not. And immediately we'll find out whether or not I'm a fake, a phony. Whereas when I declare that his sin has been forgiven, there's no way here on earth really for us to be able to visibly right here and now test whether or not that has in fact occurred. And so Jesus furthermore says, so that you might believe. Which is easier, rise up and walk or your sins be forgiven? But so that you might believe that the Son of Man has authority both in heaven and even on earth to forgive sin, I say, rise up and walk. And so in that moment, Jesus, he both forgave the iniquity, all the iniquity of this man, and physically healed him, restored his strength in his legs that he might walk simultaneously. And he did, according to Jesus, he did the latter, the physical healing of his ailment, as a sign, as a proof 
of his authority to heal the soul through the forgiveness of sin. Continuing in the quote by John Gill, sometimes Jesus heals the diseases of soul and body at once, as in the case of the paralytic man in the gospel, but spiritual diseases or soul maladies are here meant. The same with iniquities in the preceding clause. Sin is a natural, hereditary, epidemical, and mortal disease. And there are many of them. A complication of them in men which God only can cure. And he heals them by his word. By means of his gospel. Preaching peace, pardon, and righteousness by Christ. By the blood, wounds, and stripes of his son by the application of pardoning grace and mercy for healing diseases and forgiving iniquities are one and the same thing in other words in this context verse 3 of our text god forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases the word diseases in this context is synonymous with iniquity and so what we're seeing is this we're seeing we're seeing the work of the gospel the work of pardon and forgiveness through two separate lenses. It's the same thing occurring, but but we're seeing at least two. Instead of just merely one, we're seeing at least two of the gospel's effects. See, there's a sense in which in the gospel of Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven. But it's important for you and I to remember, it, it has blessed me personally this week to think in terms of not just the forgiveness of sin, but the healing of disease. And not that these are two separate things, but they are two separate ways of saying the same thing. Do we think of our sin as disease? Our sin is iniquity. Meaning our sin is an offense against God. It is an act of treason against the king of the universe. And one of our greatest needs, if not the greatest need, is that our debt, our moral debt, that we have incurred against God by our treason, that this debt would be canceled. And we think of sin and the forgiveness of sin most often, I I believe, in these terms. Sin is a debt that we accrue against God by our treason, by our breach of his law, and the forgiveness of sin is the gracious work of God through Christ Jesus to cancel that moral debt. All of that is biblically true. Yes and amen. And I think that's the primary way that we need to think of sin. But it is also true for us to think of sin in terms, as Gill says, in terms of sin being, what does he say? A natural, hereditary, epidemical, and mortal disease. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's important for us to think of our sin in these terms as well. That sin is not just an offense against God. That's first and foremost what it is. That is what is most serious about our sin. But sin is also a disease, a mortal disease, that is self-destructive. Our sin hurts us. Now, the reason why it's hard for us to remember this is because the only reason we sin at the end of the day is because we've bought into the lie that by doing this sin, we're somehow going to help ourselves. The reason why we sin against God, all sin is rooted in ultimately the sin of unbelief. All sin can be boiled down to a lack of faith. That we're not trusting God. We're not believing in his character, his promises, his covenant. We're not trusting these things. And so we look to something else or someone else. We have idolatrous affections. We go to something other than God in order to meet the desires of our heart. All sin is rooted in unbelief. And so it's hard for us to think of our sin as a disease, a spiritual harmful disease because the only reason we sin in the first place is because in the moment of our sin, we believe it's good for us. 
We don't think it's a disease. We think it's a remedy. We think it's medicine. We think it's nourishment. That's why we do it. But in biblical terms, our sin is not only iniquity, which God through Christ forgives, but our sin is a disease which God through Christ heals. He heals. To say it one, one more way, the gospel is not merely the pronouncement that God has canceled our moral debt against him, but the gospel is also the balm which heals the wounds of the diseased and wearied sinner who has self-inflicted harm and pain by their refusal to trust in God. And I think we don't think of sin in these terms and forgiveness and the effects of the gospel in these terms because that, in some ways, seems even more scandalous. We know that the gospel is a scandal. The fact that God, or it seems to be a scandal, the fact that a holy, thrice holy God would forgive a defiant creature who has transgressed him, that, that's, that's crazy. But in some ways, it feels even crazier that not only would God cancel our debt, but then he would begin to, to heal our self-inflicted wound. That's, that just feels almost impossible. It's like, yeah, God forgave my debt. God forgave my sin. But he's not going to, to heal the wounds inflicted by sin, is he? Who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. The same gracious God who is willing to cancel your moral debt of sin, forgiveness of iniquity, is the same gracious God who is willing to heal your own self-inflicted wounds which you caused in your attempt to defy him. Right? It's like, it's like a little kid, you know, who's like trying to, to, to rebel against mom and dad and in their rebellion, in their tantrum, have you ever had a toddler that's just like kicking and screaming and bonks their head and hurts themselves? But they hurt themselves not playing outside, not, not in a cute moment, that's one thing, right? Your heart immediately gravitates toward the child. But we're talking about the, the kid who, who hurts himself in the actual act of defiance against you. Like as they are throwing a tantrum and kicking and screaming, they, they hit themselves in the head. Those are difficult moments to be compassionate toward your child. In those moments, it is difficult to feel a great deal of sympathy towards the child. It's like, I'm sorry. That I, 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 I guess I'm kind of sorry that you hurt yourself while screaming at me, I, I guess. But that's all of our wounds, all of our diseases, all of our spiritual wounds, our self-inflicted wounds, not just in a moment, but in our actual defiance against God. We were raising our fists at God, trying to wallop God, and we missed and somehow swung around and punched ourselves in the face. And that's the wound that God promises to heal. And not just some of them, all. That is immense mercy. I feel like we could just stay there, which is why I have stayed there longer than I should. So let me try to land the plane briefly. Two more verses. Verse four says this, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. God may or may not deliver us from physical and temporal destruction in this life. However, God promises to deliver his children from eternal destruction. That is the destruction of the body and soul in hell. Not only are we promised eternal deliverance at the end of this life, but we are promised to be crowned with steadfast love and mercy throughout this life. In other words, the Christian is promised to be richly adorned by these things. Steadfast love and mercy for the Christian are not in short supply. Neither are they far off. Rather, we wear the steadfast love and mercy of the Lord upon our heads. We have been marked by the love of the Lord. We are sealed by his favor and protected from anything that would threaten to do us any real eternal harm. 
Once more, verse 4 of our text, who redeems your life from the pit. That is, he grants real, eternal salvation. And who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Think of a crown for a moment. A, a crown is something that is meant to be present, near. You wear it on your person. It's not far off. It's supposed to be something that signifies wealth, affluence, riches, right? It's, it's, it's grand, perhaps even gaudy. But a crown also is meant to, to make a statement that you are a person of honor. You are, are, are not an ordinary, average individual. You've been set apart. You've been marked. You've been sealed. A crown, it's, it's royal. It says something about the one who wears it. God not only promises to redeem us from the pit, that is, to save us from hell, but God also promises not just to save us from hell and the life to come, but to crown us with mercy and steadfast love in this life. That for the Christian, there's a very real sense in which we are a royal priesthood. We are kings. And we wear the king of kings crown, which has been given to us, setting us apart, marking us off from the rest of the world. And what does this crown say? What does it promise that is near, not far off, but near to us and near in abundance, not short supply? Mercy and steadfast love. What belongs to you at any moment, whenever you may have need of it, is mercy. And steadfast love, meaning what? The love of God that doesn't quit. Steadfast love, another way that we could say that is covenantal love. Covenantal love. A love that can't be broken. A love that is steadfast, long-suffering. A love that, is, that has endurance. A love that's sustainable. A love that's not fragile easily broken by, by any betrayal or, or any transgression. No, what God has given to us that is near, that is rich and abundant, not in short supply, and that, that adorns us in a way that sets us apart and honors, honors us and, and esteems us is what? His mercy and steadfast covenantal love. Meaning whenever we fall, whenever we falter, whenever we fail, whenever we sin, God's mercy, His covenantal love is there, it is near us, and it is present in abundance. Lastly, verse 5. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? God satisfies His children with the good things of His heart. Though the outward man may decay, the inward man is being renewed day by day. As the saint grows feeble with age. His soul only strengthens in grace and in hope. I think of the New Testament that talks about our outer man, our outer selves are wasting away. But inwardly, the inward man is being renewed day by day. For those who are in Christ Jesus, our strength, our physical strength in this life will fail. Some of you have experienced this. You, you currently are at a stage of life where you feel your physical strength giving way. Oh, but what hope for the Christian. That as our physical strength diminishes, for the saint, they are being renewed day by day inwardly, spiritually, so that physically our strength diminishes, but spiritually our faith grows. Day by day, being renewed so that we have increased, not less hope by the end of our life. But the end of our life for the Christian should be the pinnacle of faith and hope because we have experienced day after day after day of His grace, that covenantal love and mercy that we wear as a crown. We have seen Him redeem us again and again and again 
We have been healed by the gospel and forgiven of our sins. We've experienced the daily grace of God for so long that at the end of our life, when our physical strength is at its weakest, our hope is at its strongest. Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I read that text simply to say, to to couple it with verse 5 of Psalm 103, to say that one of the ways that we are renewed, our inward man renewed day by day, is precisely as we think upon the good things of the Lord. Remember verse 5, it says, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. For the aged saint who trusts in the Lord, their spiritual youth is reinvigorated, it is renewed, it is growing in the Lord. But how? By what process? As he satisfies you with good. So how does the Lord renew our strength, our spiritual strength, as our physical strength diminishes, our our spiritual strength grows, and how does the Lord do this? He does this by daily feeding us with the good. What is the good? What good does the Lord satisfy us with? I believe Philippians 4.8. The good is not just the, the the temporary good things of this life. No, it is the goodness of God. It's all of His goodness, His kindness, His mercy, His tenderheartedness, His faithfulness, His long suffering, His steadfastness. All of these things are the good. And these are the things, yes, Christian, we must engage in our culture. We must fight to win this world from Christ. But what sustains us and keeps us from becoming jaded, what what sustains us so that our spiritual so so that our, our spiritual man does not match our physical man is that as we engage this culture with all the things that are challenging and discouraging so often that that at the end of the day we rest our head on the thoughts of the good, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, that these are the things that ultimately captivate the Christian's thoughts. So yes, we engage with darkness, but if the Christian engages in darkness without dwelling on whatever is good, what will happen at the end of it all, is just as your physical man with age will diminish, your physical strength will will wane, so will you spiritually. The Christian who does not think of the good, who is not satisfied with the good, who who with, with maybe good intentions seeks to engage the darkness, but at the cost of dwelling on whatever is pure and holy, this Christian tragically is not renewed like the eagle's. This Christian, tragically, as their physical strength gives out, their hope diminishes as well. And that is something that is more than any of us can bear. To diminish in this life physically is already painful enough. But to simultaneously have our inner man diminishing as well, because we focus more on the dark, then we focus on the light because we focus more on the evil than we choose to be satisfied with the good. Not only is it wrong and immoral for the Christian to do, but it is something that we simply cannot afford to do. And so I leave you with this. Be satisfied. Engage the evil. But be satisfied with the good. Because we desperately need our spiritual strength to be renewed like the the eagles.